Good afternoon. Um, we'll begin in just a moment. There are more seats in the front, and I see a bit through here. I see one here, unless that's being saved. Um, those of you sitting in the back may want to come to the side. If you'd like to have a seat, you could see better. There's lots of space over here along the wall, and some over here. So welcome, my name is Bob Cruz. I teach in the history department. I'd like to thank um, Burchak Keskin Kozat and Shazad Bashir, who are respectively the associate uh, director and director of the Abbasi program in Islamic studies, the host of this event. They've kindly organized this um, very important discussion and have kindly asked me to moderate. So thank you both for putting this together. I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers, both of whom are experts on Egypt, our first um, and, and the Middle East comparative politics and history, respectively. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor Joel Bainan, who's the Donald McLaughlin Professor of History in the Department of History here. Um, many of you probably know him from his courses on the Middle East, Israel-Palestine, social movements, oil, and Islam. He's the author or co-editor of some seven books. Um, I'd like to highlight a, a forthcoming book that Stanford University Press is publishing entitled Social Movements, Mobilization and Contestation in the Middle East and North Africa. That will be out this summer, I think, but this is uh, germane for our conversation. Um, he's also written, most recently, um, 2010, a, a study entitled The Struggle for Worker Rights in Egypt. He's a co-editor of, of a collected volume of essays entitled The Struggle for Sovereignty, Palestine and Israel, 1993-2005, uh, with Rebecca Stein. He's also the author of The Dispersion of Egyptian Jewry, and the co-editor of Political Islam, Essays from the Middle East Report, among others. Um, in the past, he's been the president of the Middle East Studies Association of the United States and uh, North America. And um, recently, he was director of Middle East Studies at the American University in Cairo. Our second speaker will be Lisa Blades, who is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. Um, she was hired to come to Stanford in 2007. But she had the opportunity to spend, I think, two years as an academy scholar at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies at Harvard University. Her book just appeared, I think, weeks, months ago. Uh, perfect timing. I don't know how she did this. I, I think we'll have to talk to her about her next book to see what world event will, um, she can predict for us, a kind of Nostradamus-esque touch, something for political science, right? This is amazing. Historians don't have this art of looking into the future. Um, it's entitled Elections and Distributed Politics in Mubarak's Egypt. Egypt. It appeared um, through Cambridge University Press. Um, she teaches widely on the Middle Eastern and comparative politics and publishes widely about um, Egypt, Islam, and um, the contemporary uh, uh, Middle East political landscape. So each of them will speak for roughly 15 minutes. Uh, I will then open up the floor to questions, and we hope to devote most of our time today to hearing your questions um, and comments. We will try to uh, wrap this up uh, roughly around 1.30. Um, many of you may have to go at 1, which is fine. Please feel free to do so, but the rest of us will try to stay until roughly 1.30 or so. So um, thank you again for coming, and thank you, um, Burchak and Shazad, and our first speaker, uh, Professor Joel Bainan. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for uh, the second time in a week uh, introducing an event like this, and thanks also to Burchak and Shahzad and the Abbasi Center for organizing the event. Uh, as Bob said, we're going to speak briefly, only about 15 minutes or so, which is hardly enough time to even say what happened. Uh, so I'll try to be very brief and telegraphic and, and leave more uh, substantive things to wherever you want to go in the Q&A and discussion. Uh, if any of you have paid attention to the recent events in Egypt at all, you'll probably have noticed that uh, analysis of the cause uh, has focused on two things, the demonstration effect of Tunisia and social media. Uh, these are not insubstantial. The We Are All Khalid Saeed uh, Facebook page, which is named after a 28-year-old businessman who was dragged out of an internet cafe and beaten to death by Egyptian police last June, has uh, 473,000 members. It's the largest dissident website in Egypt. The April 6th youth movement uh, has about 93,000 members at last count. Um, these two 
uh, web pages definitely had something to do uh, with the uh, shape of the events and the fact that uh, uh, demonstrations could be called on relatively short notice and so on. But I want to suggest that the more fundamental uh, factors involved in explaining these events are structural and historical. So the first structural factor actually goes along with the Facebook phenomenon, which is also largely a youth phenomenon, because uh, in Egypt, as in Tunisia, 60% of the population is under the age of the 30 years that Hosni Mubarak has been in power. And there is particularly high unemployment uh, among uh, the youth. In Egypt, the official unemployment rate is about 9.4%. That's undoubtedly a very, very low uh, estimate. Could be uh, as much as twice as much. But the official statistics for unemployment of males between 15 and 24 is 25 percent and females uh, 60 percent. And if we were to narrow down even further to university graduates, uh, the figures would be even higher. Uh, and this is the case uh, across the Arab world. So this was a common factor between Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, and. Uh, Algeria and Jordan and Yemen uh, and anywhere else where uh, there may be some ripple effect uh, of these events. The second structural factor is the intensification of the neoliberal project. Uh, the neoliberal economic reform and structural adjustment program of Egypt began in earnest with an agreement signed with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in 1991. Uh, it plodded along not too dramatically until July of 2004 when a new government dubbed the Government of Businessmen uh, was installed. The key uh, economic ministries in the government were all held by friends and cronies of uh, Hosni Mubarak's son, Gamal. Uh, and these guys uh, put uh, the neoliberal program into high gear from day one. In the, its first year in office, uh, they sold off more public assets than previous governments had sold off uh, in the uh, preceding decade. And um, they did all of the things that the IMF and the World Bank recommend that you do to attract uh, foreign investment. Uh, and uh, they were given a, a top reformer award by the World Bank. Uh, economic growth indeed took off. Uh, GDP growth from 2004 to the present has moved between 5 and uh, 7 percent roughly. Uh, that's uh, at the low end more than twice what the economic growth of the United States has been in a similar period. Uh, foreign uh, direct investment, which hovered around the range of $2 billion a year from 1978 to 2004, spiked immediately to uh, $12 billion a year by 2007, uh, and then came down with the uh, financial crash in 2008, but it's still $6 billion a year, which is three times more what it had been before this uh, government, which was just dismissed a few days ago, uh, came into office. So those are the structural factors, and the neoliberal uh, factor would also be common in Tunisia and throughout most of the Arab world. Uh, there has also been, since 2000, a series of political and social movements that the regime has sometimes tolerated, sometimes repressed, uh, so that one never quite knew what was allowed and not allowed. But within that very murky uh, situation, you had, uh, for the first time in 50 years, uh, street protests that were not uh, simply smashed by the security forces. Demonstrations in support of the Second Palestinian Intifada, demonstrations opposing the American invasion of Iraq, which the Mubarak uh, government also opposed but didn't uh, break the alliance with the United States over. Uh, you had uh, demonstrations uh, it calling, beginning in December 2004 through 2005, calling on President Mubarak not to run for re-election in 2005, which of course he did. 
Uh, you had demonstrations in the spring of 2006 defending the independence of the judiciary because the government uh, tried to diminish the role of judges, uh, many of whom do have some independence from the executive branch uh, because they had criticized uh, fraud during the previous uh, presidential and parliamentary elections. And most importantly, you had from 1998 until the present, over 3,300 strikes, sit-ins, and other collective actions by workers in which uh, well over 2 million workers participated. This is the biggest and broadest social movement in the Arab world uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, and most of you probably heard little, if anything, about it. Um, because class isn't supposed to be important anymore, and we don't believe that there is such a thing as a working class in the United States. Uh, but, but this uh, is not a strange idea in Egypt at all, uh, and uh, I think it was uh, quite important. Uh, one of the indications of its importance, aside from the fact that many workers, of course, have been participating uh, in the demonstrations, uh, is that uh, in the course of the demonstrations, a new independent trade union federation has been uh, formed. Uh, in Egypt, as in many other authoritarian uh, regimes, the trade union federation is essentially an arm of the regime. Uh, it did not support the upsurge of labor protest uh, over the last uh, decade or so. It more often actively opposed it. Uh, of two uh, independent unions were formed in 2008 and 2010, uh, and now they and several representatives of uh, other uh, industrial zones have uh, formed uh, a labor, an, an independent labor federation. Um, I want to read uh, one version of the demands of the demonstrators. There are many. Um, all sorts of people are stepping forward to claim that they represent people who basically have no representatives because there is no leader of this movement. It's both its strength and its weakness. Uh, so the demands are the resignation of uh, President Mubarak, and this is from a press conference that happened uh, yesterday. So, And by the way, this does not contradict the peaceful transition of power nor the current constitution which allows and organizes this process. Uh, two, the immediate lifting of the state of emergency and releasing all uh, detainees. Uh, the immediate three, the immediate dissolution of both the parliament and the Shura Council, that's the upper uh, legislative house. Four, the formation of a national unity government. Five, forming a judicial committee to investigate uh, the attacks uh, and deaths and injuries of demonstrators in previous days. Um, six, the military should be in charge of protecting uh, peaceful demonstrators from thugs and criminals affiliated with the corrupt regime. And seven, the immediate release of all the detainees and our colleague, Wael Ghanem, who has in fact been released just a few hours ago. Um, I want to raise some sharp points uh, about what we might learn uh, from watching this. Um, one, there's a problem in American political discourse where Hosni Mubarak for decades has been considered a moderate. Vice President Biden, only uh, 10 days ago or so, said he's not a dictator. Secretary of State Clinton, around the same time, proclaimed that the government of Egypt is stable. I wrote this uh, report for the Solidarity Center, the struggle for worker rights in Egypt, which uh, Professor Cruz mentioned. And uh, Solidarity Center is linked to the AFL-CIO, which means ultimately to the Democratic Party. And consequently, when I wrote the introduction sort of describing the regime in Egypt and calling it an authoritarian regime, the AFL-CIO's uh, reviewer came back and said, well, uh, isn't it a semi-authoritarian regime? That's like being a little bit pregnant, right? Uh, no, it's an authoritarian regime, and we would have looked pretty stupid, wouldn't we have, if we had used that word. So ask yourself, why, why does mainstream American political discourse desist from calling a spade a spade? Uh, two, who does the United States, after having supported a dictatorship in Egypt for 30 years, want to succeed 
uh, President Mubarak, Vice President Omar Suleiman, who Mubarak appointed a week ago, and who represents exactly the same forces in Egyptian society. That means continuity of uh, the army as the central pillar of the regime. Israel is gung-ho for that too, by the way. Uh, when there was a crisis that the Obama administration recognized, who do they send to be the direct channel to President Mubarak? Uh, former ambassador to Egypt, Frank Wisner. Frank Wisner uh, works for Patton and Boggs, which has lobbied for the Egyptian government. He's on the board of directors of CIB, the biggest bank in Egypt. So of course, he would be the logical person to send. And surprise, when he finishes talking with President Mubarak, he, in his wisdom, has concluded that Mubarak should remain in power until September. Um, another point, um, probably the single most common question I've been asked by media since this thing broke out is, what about the Muslim Brothers? Aren't they going to take over? Um, and even the New York Times, which I no longer subscribe to uh, for this reason, in today's story, so this is the most important story in a newspaper, what comes on the top right, uh, says, the government announces in the second paragraph, the government announced that the transition had begun with a historic meeting between Vice President Omar Suleiman and two representatives of the Muslim Brother, the outlawed Islamist group the Egyptian government has sought to repress for many years as a threat to stability. After that, we find out that there were 50 other people in the room and two Muslim Brothers representatives. And we don't even know who the other 48 people were. So the, even the New York Times, and actually right next to it is a pretty good article by uh, uh, Michael Slackman, who knows Arabic and knows Egypt well, but even the New York Times uh, you know, just kind of follows this Islamophobic uh, thing. Um, finally, um, there are no secrets. Uh, one of the WikiLeaks uh, documents that was released has a whole list of businesses that the Mubarak family is alleged to be uh, involved in. Their collective wealth is something in the range of $70 billion if you count all that up. Um, and many people are shocked to find out about this through the WikiLeaks uh, releases. I got that document in an email four years ago. Um, so we didn't need WikiLeaks to know that. I mean, it's not 100% clear that everything in the document is true. That's not the point. The point is, uh, if you wanted to know, you could know. Um, finally, talking about this event as though it were part of normal politics misses understanding what the people, at least, want it to be. Uh, the definition of a revolution is that a crime becomes the basis of a new legality. And that's what the people in the street are about, whether or not they win or not is unclear. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bainan. There are more seats both on either side of us here, for those of you who are standing in the back. There are places to sit on the floor uh, on either side of, of the chairs here. So please do um, take a seat. There are also two seats here, one in the front row, one in the second row. Um, next, we have uh, Professor Lisa Blades. Let me help you with that. You want to start talking at all? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be trying to answer three very pointed questions <clears throat> regarding the implications of the popular uprising in Egypt for you today using a particular type of methodology. So um, the first question I want to try to address is who is protesting and why? And Joel talked a little bit about some of these issues, but I'm going to try to look at things from a slightly different perspective. The second is what can we expect from free elections in Egypt? And the third question is how will this impact Egyptian attitudes toward the United States? So some obvious points about the protesters. Men seem to be overrepresented relative to their percentage of the population. It seems to be a youth movement, relatively young, not old. Variety of class backgrounds seem to be represented. But can we say more about who the protesters are based on survey data that was collected prior to the protests? So we have this sort of picture in our minds about who these individuals are. 
but do we think that maybe considering this national sample of Egyptians that were polled in 2008, we might get some broader sense of what is going on and who the people are that are actually in the streets? So people were asked, um, would you consider attending a lawful or peaceful demonstration in a nationally representative poll of 3,000 Egyptians? And 8% of respondents answered that they would. And if we assume a total Egyptian population of about 83 million, 8% um, is about 6.5 million people. <clears throat> so who are these individuals? We think that probably a willingness to answer in the affirmative um, underestimates the people who would be willing to go out into the street, but I think it's still worth sort of considering who these 8% were. So what are the demographic and other factors associated with a willingness to protest? Of those who responded they would protest, about 45% were women. But we've seen that the vast majority of people on the street are men. And part of this has to do with the reports of both thugs and police engaging in acts of sexual harassment, groping, threats of rape against women. So if we now look at the sample of men who said that they would go out and protest, what do we know? About 12% that they would, said they would be willing to protest. And this percentage actually increases for certain subgroups. So if we look at men just under the age of 35, about 17% said they would be willing to protest. Those with a formal education increases that number to 18%. In the middle class, 31%. And if we say that a man was under the age of 35, had a formal education, was of the upper middle class and a regular internet user, that jumps to 36%. Finally, if we add to that an interest in politics, we raise that number to 50%. So of the Egyptians who were polled in this sample, the men who were polled in this sample, if you met these criterion of being young, formally educated, upper middle class, an internet user, and interested in politics, you had about a one in two probability of, being, of saying you would protest in this type of a demonstration. So in other words, it's not simply the people who are most aggrieved, right? We can think about large swaths of the Egyptian population who have more grievances even than this type of individual who are most likely to say they'll protest, but also those who are aware and socially connected. So people have a lot of reasons for engaging in this type of activity, and one that's frequently talked about is this idea of income inequality. Um, Tim Mitchell has argued that modest affluence, for example, is enjoyed by just 5% of Egyptians, with 3% of Egyptians accounting for half of all consumer spending. Half of the population living on less than $2 a day. Yet the protesters are not chanting slogans demanding economic redistribution from rich to poor. Rather, their biggest grievance seems to be related to corruption and abuses of government. So citizens are enraged by the byproducts of corruption committed on the part of regime cronies. The economic elite were really co-opted by this regime and offered opportunities for corruption in exchange for support. And nowhere was this more obvious than in the parliament. So parliamentarians associated with the hegemonic party, the National Democratic Party, have been notorious abusers of power. MPs have been implicated in everything from drug dealing to financial fraud, negligence with regard to public safety, thuggery, and even murder. So these everyday acts of government neglect and corruption are an incredible source of frustration and disappointment for the Egyptian people. So consider some of the most commonly discussed news stories that were in the press in the months leading up to the survey that I've just told you about. Corrupt businessmen were um, accused of growing their profits by incorporating bleach and chalk into powdered milk for children. Um, contaminated medical equipment was used in kidney dialysis, dialysis machines in public hospitals. There were reports that ambulance, ambulance crews would be subject to criminal action if they impeded the ability of senior government officials to move through the streets. And there were reports that the government was selling land to foreigners and regime cronies in a series of corrupt scams and land deals. So these are just a sampling of the stories that appear in the Egyptian press and are discussed by regular Egyptians day in and day out, year after year. So the Mubarak regime was fully aware of public dissatisfaction. The regime actually conducts its own surveys of the public to find out what their issues are with the government. So in 2009, a government survey found that the majority of respondents listed businessmen, especially those with close links to authorities, as the most corrupt group in society. And Mubarak has tried in some ways to rein in these groups. He made a speech on May Day last year saying that Egyptian businessmen should stop flaunting their wealth. But really, um, his coalition includes a lot of these very individuals. And we know, as Joel mentioned, that smaller scale public demonstrations have been taking place in Egypt for years. And they are protesting both the corruption and the abuses of authority committed by the government. Very frequently, those protesters are labeled criminals. They're sometimes labeled terrorists. But indeed, they have these economic grievances at their core. Egyptian elections have also provided individuals with more and less subtle ways to express forms of dissent. So we know that electoral support for the Brotherhood represents one form of dissent someone might show with the regime. 
But we also see that people engage in an act of ballot spoiling when they're dissatisfied with their regime. So let me show you a graph that shows on the y-axis the percentage of spoiled ballots across Egyptian electoral districts, and on the x-axis the literacy rate in those districts. And what you can see is a really interesting U-shaped relationship. So sure, for districts where people are not literate, you expect there to be some level of ballot spoiling because they're marking their ballots incorrectly as a result of their lack of education. But what you also see is that in districts that have very high levels of literacy, there are also high levels of spoiled ballots. And this is because people in those areas are trying to say something to the regime with their ballot spoiling about their dissatisfaction with government. So these results are from the 2005 parliamentary election, but we see a very similar pattern across Egyptian governorates for the 2005 presidential election. So this raises the question of what can we then expect from free elections in Egypt? Now one thing that's important to point out is that Egyptians are accustomed to voting on the basis of patronage, not policy. And this has been something that's been sort of systematically ingrained in the nature of electoral competition in Egypt for many years now. If you think about who your choices are to vote for, most of them are either NDP representatives or people associated with the NDP. So there's no difference really in terms of the policy outcomes associated with most of the people you're choosing from. As a result, people vote on the basis of patronage, and we see that vote buying is extremely widespread in Egypt. Family big men often control the votes of large numbers of people in their extended clans. <coughs> and the median voter in Egypt is poor and may prefer the guaranteed payment today of a vote broker rather than some discounted value they associated with some policy outcome down the line. So if you think about a poor Egyptian who can take a 50 pound note today, or they can say, well, you know, somebody promised me redistribution of, the, um, of economic resources in two years. What is the choice that they're going to make? Very frequently, it's the choice to take the guaranteed value today. And so there's this question about, under free elections, will the policy preferences of the median voter even be honored, right? We have to think about how we can actually represent the interests of these people and how the existing electoral institutions are not doing that very well. We know that supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, on the other hand, have long voted on the basis of programmatic grounds. These are people whose votes are not bought when they go out and turn out in often very difficult conditions to show their support for the Muslim Brotherhood candidates. We know the Muslim Brotherhood won about 20% of votes in the highly competitive 2005 parliamentary elections. And I think we can think of this 20% as a sort of reasonable lower bound on how the Brotherhood might do in free elections moving forward. I say a lower bound because those, um, that 20% was won under, very extreme, uh, under extremely difficult conditions, right? Repression of the group, um, intimidation of voters, and um, uh, towards the end of the election that was conducted in multiple rounds, even just basically shutting down the availability of the polling places to Brotherhood supporters. But can we make a reasonable estimate regarding the size of Egypt's religious right? And what can we think of as sort of an upper bound associated with how this group might perform in elections moving forward? So if we take some reasonable um, sort of assumptions about what make, who makes up the religious right in Egypt, what kind of results can we get? So if we think about three factors defining the religious right in Egypt being personal religiosity, in other words, people who are highly personally pious, people who have a support for political Islam, in other words, they believe that religious individuals should have an impact on policy, that they should have an impact, Islamic law should have an impact on the way government is run, and traditionalist values that favor men over women in some systematic way. And why is this important? Why are gender relations of particular importance to Islamists? Well, one thing we know is that individuals on the religious right tend to focus on issues of morality as they relate to the reputation and chastity of women. So if we take these three components as sort of defining features of, we, of what we might consider the religious right, how large a group are we talking about? Defined in this way, we can estimate the size of the right using responses to surveys. So um, this only works, though, if we believe that respondents are actually revealing their preferences through the answers offered in survey questions. And this is something we can talk about more. So um, a battery of questions were used to sort of determine what the different social groups were in Egypt, um, in my analysis, based on this type of characterization of the religious right. For example, when jobs are scarce, should men have more of a right to a job than a woman would be sort of an example of a question that picks up this systematic bias in favor of, women, of men versus women. Um, and then questions were asked about how important is religion in your life, how important is God in your life, questions about should Islamic law be implemented, should religious leaders have influence or not over government decisions. And if we think about these questions as 
picking up something about the underlying preferences of the population being surveyed, what do we find out? Well, if we break down Egypt by different types of people that we think might have preferences over these different questions, the religious right ends up occupying about 60% of the population. About 60% of Egyptians in this nationally representative survey would say that they do systematically favor men over women, that they are highly personally pious, and that they do believe there should be some confluence of religion and state. So I think of that 60% as sort of a possible upper bound. This is the pool from which a group like the Muslim Brotherhood may be able to draw some electoral support. Religious reformers uh, make up about another 20%. So these are people who are personally pious, but do not hold um, views that are systematically anti-woman, for example. Secularists make up another 20% of Egypt's population. Now, how can we compare Egypt to other countries in the region? So think about the same breakdown using the exact same survey questions for the population of Iran. We can see the religious right in Iran is actually half the size of Egypt, right? That's only about 30%. Secularists make up about 35% of the population. And re religious reformers are another 35%. So um, it's interesting to sort of compare how do these different countries look if you take the schematic as one representation of the preferences of the population. If we look at Algeria, where we know in the early 1990s, Islamists performed quite well in free elections, we see the religious right is smaller than the religious right in Egypt. They represent about 40% of the population, with 30% being religious reformers and another 30% being secularists. If we look about at Egypt and how it compares to Muslim populations in 18 countries, it actually ends up being quite conservative, with one of the largest populations of religious right in the Muslim world. So, there are lots of unknowns. There's no guarantee that all or even most religiously minded people would actually be supporters of religiously based parties. That's why I've used the language of bounds to try to think about what the lower bound versus the upper bound might be for support of this group. We can't give you a point estimate. It's not the kind of thing that can be easily estimated because we don't know how religious preferences might translate into votes. We also don't know that a party of the religious right in Egypt would be significantly different than the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, right? We might see a party emerge that has very moderate preferences. Nonetheless, I think it's worth considering first the design of electoral institutions to maximize the vote and the voice of the median voter, while at the same time balancing important protections for women and minorities like Coptic Christians living in Egypt whose interests may be vulnerable under democracy. So um, I wanted to end by just talking very briefly about the impact of US actions on anti-Americanism in Egypt. So we know that anti-Americanism in Egypt is already so widespread, it can really only increase in intensity and not in its pervasiveness. In 2010, for example, only 17% of Egyptians expressed a favorable attitude toward the United States. And one thing that we might want to think about doing is disaggregating anti-Americanism in Egypt to see if maybe the impact of US policy does not have a uniform effect over all people. So are there different types of anti-Americanism in Egypt is the question I want to try to address here. And so again, we look to surveys where a national sample of Egyptians has offered their opinion about whether they have favorable attitudes toward the United States, toward the American people, toward various policy decisions. And then there are a series of questions which describe <coughs> things like, I like American ways of doing business, or I dislike American ways of doing business. I like American music, movies, and television, or not. And how people view um, the United States in terms of its technological and scientific advances. And if we break down and sort of disaggregate this broad idea of anti-Americanism in this way, what we see is four distinct types of people emerge in the population. The first are those that dislike both the policies and the attributes associated with the United States. And this represents about 54% of the population. There's another 28% that dislikes both the policies, or dislikes the policies, but actually likes the attributes we associate with the US. There's 13% which dislikes the attributes associated with the US, for example, the music, the movies, the technology, but actually likes Americans in the United States. And then 5% of people are sort of completely favorably inclined to the United States on all dimensions. So we might think that only some of these populations are really going to be impacted heavily by the nature of US policy in Egypt moving forward. So just to conclude, um, three points I want to try to emphasize. The median protester in Egypt has a different demographic profile than the median voter in Egypt and may hold distinct preferences. The second is the median voter in Egypt is personally pious and a traditionalist with regard to the role of women in society. 
But there's a lot of uncertainty about how these preferences will translate into electoral outcomes moving forward. And finally, Egyptians are already highly anti-American. Anti-Americanism in Egypt takes a variety of forms, of which only some are likely to be impacted by US actions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blades. So the floor will now be open, but I would ask you please to preface your question with some kind of brief self identification so that our speakers know uh, who you are. So the floor is open. Yes, in the front row here. Uh, Mary Dakin. Uh, sure, please. Thank you. Thank you. paving the way for all the questioners. <laughs> okay. Good job, Mary. Um, go. I'm Mary Dakin. I work here at Stanford. And my question for you, my two questions are, how confident are you that you can extrapolate from this 2008 survey data to the people actually on the square? Um, and the second question is kind of about the usage of the term redistribution of income and wealth. Because it feels to me like a pretty big jump from an authoritarian, corrupt economy to people demanding redistribution of wealth. And isn't there some kind of middle ground? Is that actually the language and part of the politi political rhetoric of the protesters? Thanks. Two, two important questions. Um, how confident am I that the survey respondents actually reflect the people who are showing up in the streets? We don't have any knowledge that that actually is what's happening. But if you're an individual who's willing to say in a survey under authoritarian conditions that you would be willing to engage in a demonstration, that tells me something about who you are and perhaps your willingness for risk, how much you dislike the regime. And I think that that underlying factor, that latent characteristic of that person, is the same type of latent characteristic that would then map onto somebody who actually would engage in public protest. Um, now, the language of redistribution, I think it's really interesting that this language has sort of been purged from the um, discourse in Egypt to a great extent because the regime has tried to you know, map political preferences onto a different dimension than we have in most advanced industrialized countries, for example. So in most countries of the Western world, you know, we see people talking about left-right ideological spectrum, meaning on the right you prefer less redistribution, and on the left you prefer more redistribution. But it's been a very conscious effort that the Mubarak regime has put into um, sort of shaping the political sphere that they don't want discourse to be discussed in this way because it doesn't benefit the crony capitalists who are really in bed with the regime and have been for 30 years now. So I think that there's a possibility that we might see a revival of the left. We might see um, this really changing moving forward. But thus far, the language has really focused on these issues related to governmental abuse and corruption. Uh, Professor Bannon, would you like to add anything or comment? I, I'm not sure how to insert this into um, the way that Lisa is putting things because it's, it's not how I think. But if you've had a decade of labor protests, and if the salient issue in the labor protests is that when public enterprises are privatized, the new owners don't pay the same wages, benefits, bonuses, what have you, uh, and they fire a bunch of workers, uh, the way that translates in a, any one local strike or protest is we want our back wages, we want our uh, back bonus, um, we want guarantees that people aren't going to be fired, we want the dismissal of this or that abusive uh, manager or what have you. But if you add it up over a decade, it's a pretty broad-based repudiation of neoliberal economic policies, and that is a left position uh, on this spectrum of redistribution or not. Now, people 
don't usually put it out that way. But when I've gone to visit striking workers, for example, uh, and they want their picture taken with me, they go out to the statue of Gamal Abdel Nasser, who is the symbol <coughs> of redistributive policies in Israel, uh, in Israel, in Egypt, and they, and they crowd around Nasser and want me to be photographed with them around the statue of Nasser. Couldn't be clearer what their politics are. Thank you. Yes, here. If you speak loudly, perhaps. I think, I think because okay. it's being taped, so you have to do that. No? Okay. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm a first year law student and a PhD student in the history department. And my question is and my question is primarily for Professor Blades. So I wondering if you could talk a bit more about the implications for the uh, lower bound, upper bound figures that you gave, because I think while you based those on sort of fairly narrow, or not exactly narrow, but specific conceptions of what you mean by religious right, it would be easy to walk away with sort of broad-based implications for what 60% could mean in terms of Egypt's foreign policy towards Israel and the US. So I was hoping you could speak a bit more to what you think the foreign policy implications are of that. Thank you. I think a lot depends on what happens in the next few weeks and months as we move forward to new elections in Egypt. If parties are able to begin to organize their interests in ways where programmatic platforms make sense to regular Egyptians, and people began to understand their uh, demands for better wages, for back bonuses, for all of these types of goods that they associate with improvements to their quality of life with certain parties, then we might start to see um, a different landscape. But what we see now is really a landscape where people vote on the basis of patronage, and these patronage interests do not include these types of interests articulated in any meaningful way. So when I say there's an upper bound, I sort of consider the 60%, the pool from which religious elite or religious right might be able to pull voters. But if these individuals get pulled off into other party formations or in support of other types of political parties based on some other type of identification, then I think we could see that number go considerably down. But at this point, really the dominant dimension along which politics has been discussed and I think this was very much in line with what the regime wanted to happen, was in terms of this religious secular issue dimension. A, a good number of the people who would fall in the religious right are supporters and members of the National Democratic Party. So th this doesn't tell you exactly where people might fall <coughs> in terms of a free election. Thank you. So we now have two microphones, one on either side of the room. Um, perhaps we'll start here and miss the wall. Hello, hi. My name is Nadine Bogegas, and I come from Libya. Uh, my question is, um, in an interview with Omar Suleiman last week, uh, when he was asked if uh, he believes and supports democracy, he said, yes, of course I do. Uh, this is not the issue. The issue is that people are not ready for democracy here. Um, do you think this is valid for countries that have been dictated for decades and people living there, uh, living without knowing their human rights? So I think the first problem with an exchange like that is what's democracy? Is democracy a set of procedural rules that you have an election and you elect a parliament and according to whatever constitutional norms there are. Um, and the election is more or less free and there's some chance that there will be a rotation of power. That's kind of the minimal definition. Um, I, I think that's utterly inadequate. It, it's, it's a, it doesn't get at what goes on in a society. Democracy, if and when it happens, is the consequence of a struggle. And maintaining a democracy is a constant struggle 
because there are always people who want there to be less democracy rather than more democracy. Look at the history of the United States. If we were to look now at the Constitution as it was originally established with African Americans being considered three-fifths of a person with women not having the right to vote and any number of other things, we would say that's not a very democratic constitution. Well, it took us a civil war to get to where we are, among other things, and lots of other social movements and mobilizations as well. So even in the best of circumstances, and I'm not so confident that Egypt is going to be facing the best of circumstances, we're not going to see within the next uh, eight months a switch turned off or on, and there's going to be democracy. Uh, there, even if, big if, there's a very, very good formal constitutional democracy with very good electoral rules in place for the presidential election. Probably that won't happen, but even if it does, that's not the end of the story. It's only the beginning of a possible story. I just wanted to add, I don't think that there are any minimal levels of per capita GDP we should associate with the possibility for democracy to thrive. So we've seen democracies in poor countries before. That's not really the issue. I think that as we're moving through this transition process, the important thing will be thinking about what types of guarantees certain segments of the population, certain minority or vulnerable groups might need in order to get on board with a system that will um, allow the median voter to express his or her will. Thank you. So maybe on this side of the room, is there someone? Uh, yes, in the front row here. Tom Finger from here at FSI. Given that there are many, many reasons for dissatisfaction uh, in Egypt, and specifically with the performance of the government, why has turnout been so low? I mean, give or take 80 million people have stayed home. And given the authoritarian, repressive character of the regime, why would anybody bet against the regime re weathering the demonstrations and retaining power? First, I, I think your number is on the low side for numbers of people who have participated in this. Um, and that may very well be due to the fact that the media has focused on Tahrir Square in Cairo. The size of the demonstrations in Alexandria has been even bigger. Uh, and uh, in part that's because Alexandria is also a stronghold of the Muslim Brothers, and they are the biggest and the best organized opposition force. Uh, friends who have been in the crowd in Cairo uh, say that the Brothers are 10% of the crowd. I mean, how you judge that, I don't know, but a relatively low proportion, but it would be higher in Alexandria for sure. There have also been big and powerful demonstrations and the most bloody demonstrations in the Suez Canal port city of Suez. And there have been demonstrations in Ismailia, in Mansoura, in Mahala al Kubra, very big ones, and all workers, that's a workers' town. Uh, Aswan, where there's, as far as I know, never been a political demonstration before, or at least not since 1919. Altogether, I think 11 different cities. So it's probably in the range of two million plus people. Still, out of a population of 80, 81 million, or whatever it is, um, a low proportion to be sure. Uh, and I think here I would agree with the implication of uh, something that uh, Lisa said. There are lots of grievances out there. There's no doubt. I mean, 44% of the Egyptian people, according to the World Bank, are living under or just above the poverty line of $2 a day. You know, those people have plenty of grievances, and there's good reason for that whole 44% to be on the street, and they're not. So in any uh, radical upsurge or revolutionary upsurge, it's typically not the most aggrieved who are uh, the vanguard element. It is typically exactly the, the typology that, that Lisa lined out in the first section uh, of her uh, comments. Uh, and those people have plenty of grievances too. Because if you are a young male with a college education, you're highly likely not to be employed. Uh, even if you are interested in politics and know about the internet and so forth and so on. 
Um, so there's a, a sort of blockage of aspiration of the youth, which is a very important element uh, in the demonstrations uh, beyond the, the, the Facebook uh, phenomenon. So we're ready for a new question from this side, perhaps. Here. Yes, Hello, my name is uh, George Papachristos. I'm from Greece and I'm a Sloan Fellow at the GSB. Uh, my question would be, what should be Americans, uh, the, the reaction of the United States, if this effect of uh, regime change spills over in the rest of the Arab world, and especially countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, where the economic interests are much bigger, and the support of uh, this kind of regimes, how is it linked uh, from your point of view with the war on terror? Thank you. Who would like to take those many questions first? Uh, we have a kind of a contest here between history and political science to see which will win in the end of the day. So I, I guess this just answer. gets down to the fundamental problem the United States has here, which is a difference between what it sees as its national interest versus the core values it associates with its democracy. And here, these two ideas are coming you know, to a very difficult point. And how that's going to play out, I think, is, is not known. And I think that there are people in the Obama White House right now who are working through these very issues um, about the possibility of uh, these types of demonstrations spreading to the Gulf states. It's not totally clear to me that we've seen indications that that's going to happen. We know the Kuwaitis sort of defensively have engaged in forms of higher levels of distrib redistribution to their population now to sort of stave off that possibility. But um, it seems to be a phenomenon that is primarily focused on the republics of the Arab world. And um, the monarchies have enjoyed a little bit of a, of a buffer. I, I think to be precise about it, we need to take the global war on terror out of the equation. The United States has supported dictatorships in the Middle East and in every other part of the world for that matter, long before anyone ever heard of terrorism as a problem. Um, the first was uh, installing the Shah of Iran uh, in 1953 in a coup uh, led by the CIA. And there are many, many, many others before 9-11. Thank you for the pithy answer <laughs> um, for both of you. Um, we'll return to this side of the room behind you. Um, I'm sorry, the mic against the wall there. Oh, grab it. Yep. Thank you. My name is Khalid Abid. I'm from the Arabic program here at Stanford. Um, my question is um, actually more uh, Egyptians are getting more suspicious of the role of the United States, especially after assigning Omar Suleiman as the vice president. And many of them think that this is kind of a game to get the uh, demonstrators get tired quickly and the number get less and less until it, it fade and go away. And uh, from now until September, enough time for Omar Suleiman to play games, to stay in power, and even through elections. And we know how the elections happen in the, in the time of Mubarak. The, the people who think that are exactly right. <laughs> and the other, uh, the other part that they are very suspicious is Let's say that there is free uh, elections in September, um, and we are having a surprise like the one that happened in Palestine and Hamas won, and let's say that the Brotherhood Movement won. And we know that the Brotherhood Movement clearly made it that we are not going to run for presidential elections, we're going to run for parliamentary elections. And let's say that we get surprised and they get enough votes to form the government. What guarantees that the United States will accept these results and will not in, impose embargo just like what happened with Hamas and people will lose more and faith in, in democracy? I, I don't think there are any guarantees about what's going to happen moving forward. Um, I don't know, Joel, if you have something to add. No, I agree. There, there are no guarantees about what the United States uh, foreign policy is going to be. Um, it has a long history of being uh, undemocratic and uh, of rejecting uh, democratic choices, uh, not only uh, Hamas among the Palestinians, but Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, and it has accepted, essentially, the Mubarak regime's claim for its entire 30-year tenure that we can't have too much democracy in Egypt because the Islamists will win. Uh, 
votes. So I, I would expect them to uh, not be totally uh, enthused by any Islamist success uh, in Egypt, even if it's uh, short of a majority. Okay, so we'll return to this side of the room. Um, here, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Sufyan Kerwi. I'm a student at the GSB. Um, this is a question for uh, Joel. Um, the protesters demand the, the dismantling of what they view as the apparatus of oppression. And at the, at the moment, the opposition is negotiating with the leading figures of this apparatus of oppression. Uh, do you believe that these figures will really agree to the dismantling of the systems they created? I.e., what do you think is the most likely outcome of these negotiations? Well, one of the benefits of being a historian is that we don't have to talk about the future. We only have to talk about the past. Um, but, but let me say this. Um, first, the opposition isn't one thing. The people who have been most active in negotiating with Omar Suleiman have been this self-appointed committee of wise men. There are a few women in there, but that's what they're called. Um, and uh, Nagib Sawiris, the richest businessman in Egypt by quite a margin, is one of the key actors in that group. Uh, and it's quite significant that someone like that has essentially broken with the regime. Uh, he thinks he's big enough and powerful enough to tussle with them uh, if they try to get him, and they do uh, try to get people who operate independently. Um, there are also folks like uh, Yusri Nasrallah, the famous uh, director, and Basma Ahmed, a well-known actress who happens to be a personal friend um, in this group, and, and think tank people, Amr Hamzawi, Amr Shabaki, and so on. Those people don't represent the protesters. They appointed themselves on the basis of their self-proclaimed wisdom. Uh, so they are negotiating. And um, Nagib Sawiris, according to the report that I read just as I was walking in here, uh, told the protesters that they were going to have to accept that Mubarak wasn't going to go before September, which is, of course, the main demand of the people in the street, that he go immediately. It was even a demand of President Obama until a couple of days ago. So um, it's not clear whether those people are, in fact, going to be able to impose that sort of compromise, which will end up in no real change, uh, on the people in the street. Uh, there were many more people in the street on Sunday than those who were predicting that the regime will succeed in wearing people down uh, thought was possible. Now, the regime may still succeed in wearing people down, but, but so far uh, we're not quite uh, at that place. Uh, the people who, with some legitimacy, can claim to represent the people in the street have made it very clear that the sine qua non of any agreement is uh, that Mubarak leaves. And uh, uh, Muhammad al-Baradai, even though he also uh, is not a leader of the protests, because he didn't even support the January 25th demonstration. He was in Vienna when it happened. But he's spoken very sharply on that question. So the opposition is not united. and we will know that they will win when it becomes clear that the regime is not united. And that's not so clear yet. Lisa, did you want to add anything? Or? No. No. May I shift the conversation slightly um, away from the United States, away from the Muslim Brothers, though I'm sure we'll return to both problems. And could you say a few words, I apologize for the difficulty of this in advance, because this is um, what would have to be clairvoyant, like Lisa, to see into the future. Um, but could you say a few words about two major social institutions in Egypt? Um, or presumably important institutions. Uh, the officer corps and general staff um, being one, one body. Uh, what do we know about these groups sociologically? Um, where would they fit, Lisa, in your typology? Um, <clears throat> secondly, again, not the Muslim Brothers, but the more prosaic religious establishment, right, of the kind of the Al-Hazar and, and um, the conventional non-Islamist religious leaders of, of Egyptian society. To be sure, there's some overlap, but again, in those two bodies, can one characterize their views along these same kinds of um, 
kinds of mappings. And um, perhaps a third broader question, just to shift somewhat um, away from Washington and Cairo, what, is the, what can one say about the regional context in which this is happening? Um, we've touched on this, there have been some questions, um, but what should we be looking at in terms of Egypt's neighbors? Israel, the Saudis, Iraq, Iran, right? Um, how would you put it in terms of what we should be um, expecting, or at least um, what we should be looking at in looking at the um, international ramifications of this? Um, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of what help neighbors might offer uh, Egypt, it might tip the balance in, in one way or another. So again, if you would talk about the, uh, the ulama, uh, the, sol the, the religious leadership, I'm sorry, the military leadership, and then finally, the international scene. Um, so we don't know a lot about the officer corps in Egypt beyond the fact that we know that their interests have been um, highly, highly invested in economic interests of the country more broadly. Right, so if you think about the business interests of the military, the Egyptian military, they are broad and wide. They are involved in everything from the manufacturing of canned goods to military armament, um, and they benefit from having these huge numbers of conscripts who basically work for nothing in the factories that they, um, that they run. So we can say something about what's different about the officer corps in a place like Egypt, for example, than in Turkey. Whereas in Turkey, the officer corps is routinely purged for people who have strong religious orientation. In Egypt, that does not take place. In fact, most Egyptian officers, I think you would consider to be quite religiously conservative. Many of them have um, wives who are veiled, for example, and this type of thing we would not observe in Turkey. So we don't know a lot. We know that they're heavily invested in the regime in terms of their economic interests. We know they've been really insulated from all of the neoliberalism that Joel has talked about as a result of their close association with the regime. What they're going to do moving forward is really hard to say. In terms of the relig religious establishment, again, this is a group that has been heavily co-opted by the regime to the point now where most of the clerics associated with Al-Azhar, for example, the premier institution of religious learning in the Islamic world, are basically bureaucrats. They're bureaucrats who serve at the behest of the regime. We know that, for example, the Coptic Pope, Baba Shnuda, came out in support of Mubarak just as the developments were unfolding <coughs> in terms of the protests, right? So the re religious establishment, I don't know, is where we can look for um, a lot of progressive thought um, with regard to what's going on. Um, I'm going to leave the, the regional context to Joel. Oh, great. <laughs> so um, the Saudis are safe for now, anyway. Um, they're, they're not going to be affected by, by this sort of thing. Um, and so uh, our oil is safe, too. Um, Tunisia you can think of as a kind of accident. Zain al Abidin Ben Ali was not as clever as Hosni Mubarak. He ruled for 23 years with an unrelenting iron fist. And that was good as long as it held. But when it broke, it broke and shattered immediately. Mubarak, by contrast, has employed a very clever and elaborate mix of co-optation and delegitimization and promoting a religious discourse, but not too religious, and allowing parties, but not all parties, and only if they do this and not if they do that, and allowing demonstrations, but not that demonstration. And so the opposition is always off balance, and many, many, many people think that there is an opening to do something or other, and there have been openings to do something or other, except one thing, to challenge the regime. Uh, so Egypt, if this movement succeeds, that's much, much more substantial over the region. First, because it will have been much more difficult than it was in Tunisia, because Egypt's population is eight times larger than Tunisia, because Egypt has historically been the center of the Arab world politically and culturally. It isn't any longer the center of the Arab world politically and culturally, although Egyptians still think it is. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it has enormous political and cultural weight. 
Um, and people will uh, look to Egypt uh, as an example, if, if it succeeds, uh, in a way that uh, Tunisia is great, but doesn't, doesn't have that kind of, uh, of cachet throughout the Arab world. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. So the floor is open again. Uh, yes, here. Hi, I'd like to find out if uh, history, okay. Uh, when was the last time was Egypt actually a democracy and what was the population at that time? And the other question is people who are still uh, holding up in uh, Tahrir, Tahrir Square, what is the likelihood that they uh, will change their mind about leaving? Because I think they feel safer in Tahrir Square with all the cameras there than just giving up and then knowing that they will be in jail or tortured, whatever. Thank you. Well, to answer the first part of your question, it depends what you think a democracy is. Uh, there was formally uh, a constitution and a constitutional monarchy from 1922 until uh, the free officers coup of 1952. Uh, there were elections. Mostly they were fraudulent. Uh, the WAFT, which was the most popular political party in the country by a very, very large margin, managed to stay in power less than seven years out of that whole range, 22 to 50 out of 30 years. Uh, and that was because the king, according to the Constitution, had the right to uh, dissolve parliament, to appoint the prime minister, and so on. Um, so you could say, okay, there was something that looked like democracy, but in practice it wasn't very democratic at all. And most importantly, power was concentrated in the hands of about 2,000 large landowners who were disproportionately represented in the parliament, who were, uh, whether they were close to the palace or opposed to the palace, formed a kind of uh, elite. Uh, and they were, uh, in one way or another, removed by the free officers' coup. So many people, peasants, for example, uh, thought that the military regime that threw the monarchy out was more democratic than the formerly democratic monarchy. So I think um, what I've tried to say before about democracy is this is a word that doesn't have a clear content and can't be thrown around as though your choice is democracy or dictatorship or democracy or political Islam or whatever. Uh, the, these kinds of terms have to be seen as dynamic um, with a certain historical context um, and, and the social forces that go into making a regime what it is. I don't know what people with the Tahrir will decide to do. I mean, if I were there, yeah, I would think I would be safer there than going home because uh, the Mukhabarat will pick you up if you go home. But uh, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, Lisa, would you like to? Yeah. So maybe perhaps uh, here? Sorry. Yes, in the back. Yeah. I'm sorry, the uh, mic is coming. Sorry. So this question is both for Joel and Lisa. So if you guys were Obama administration advisor, what would you suggest they should do and what would be the best outcome for Egypt in the next nine months? I know you're historians, but based no, on history. She, they, she, that's a legitimate question for political science. No, no, I'm not in public policy. That's a distinct field entirely. But still, based on history, and you've studied the region, so what, what would be the best outcome we could all hope for? Thank you for that difficult question. Um, so. Lisa, I appoint you as a political scientist to offer the first answer, and then Joel, the historian, will, will respond as well. I mean, I feel like I've sort of given my answer to this already in that I think that we need to honor the preferences of average Egyptians in whatever sort of government we have moving forward in Egypt. And I think to a large extent that's going to involve changes that will um, involve forms of sort of cleaning house in terms of the government but also um, redistributing some of the income away from this very small percentage of people at the very top of the income hierarchy 
to the masses that we see in Egypt today who are suffering under some pretty oppressive economic conditions. At the same time, I think that there is a danger with just um, sort of simple electoralism in that if we simply allow the preferences of the median voter to prevail without some protections for certain segments of the population, then we are doing a disservice to democracy through that process as well. In that, if you think about Egypt's 10% Coptic Christian minority, um, a minority that we don't expect is going to maybe enter into an electoral arrangement that will see their objectives well represented, um, we need to offer some protection to that type of a group. To feminist women's organizations that might see some of their strides um, set back as a result of just a pure sort of electoral formula. I think we also need to sort of think about, about those groups and what normative interests we might have in seeing in Egypt where um, certain norms of human rights related, for example, to female genital mutilation or other practices that might be very strongly supported by the median voter are not permitted to take place in quite that same way. So that's what I mean when I say guarantees. There need to be some form of guarantees for some of these basic rights that we all associate with sort of the normative goods of democracy, while at the same time um, honoring the preferences of, of regular Egyptians. So I, I agree entirely with Lisa, but I just want to make this observation. Female genital mutilation has been illegal in Egypt for some time, and it happens anyway. Lots. Uh, now what that tells you is that the law it does not determine what goes on in society. And we can extend that across the whole range of minority protections, issues and, and, uh, that Lisa mentioned and, and other similar kinds of questions. The Egyptian people have been made stupid by 60 years of autocracy. Most Egyptians don't know how to think about politics. Most Egyptians don't know the difference between a fact and not a fact. Now, this is not, I'm not like dumping on Egyptians. It's not their fault. And Do most Americans know the difference? No, Americans are pretty bad in this <laughs> respect too. Americans are pretty bad in this respect too. And I have a paper that I just gave a lecture on a few days ago about that also. But if we're talking about Egypt, we have to be real here. Um, so so there, is, there has been hardly any space in public culture to talk intelligently about matters of the day and, and what have you. I mean, of course, there's a small group of literati, uh, university professors, not all of them, however, some of them are pretty god-awful, um, who, who know what's going on in the world and talk about it of a cosmopolitan outlook, bad ideas around here and there, and so on. But um, if you were to sort of interrogate the median Egyptian about a whole range of issues uh, in Egypt or in the world, y you would be horrified. So there is a massive educational project, education for citizenship, education for uh, modern business, <coughs> education for technology that has to go on in Egypt and frankly, um, I wouldn't want to be president of Egypt because I don't, the, the job is too big. I mean, this is, this is a decades or generation long project. So even with the most perfect constitutional outcome of this moment here, um, the job will just have begun. The United States. The best thing for the United States to do is absolutely nothing. Whoever the United States backed will be considered illegitimate in Egypt. Will the United States do that? Absolutely not. And this is not because the United States is more horrible than any other country or anything like that. No. The United States is a great power, in fact, at this moment, uh, a uniquely uh, sole superpower in the world. Great powers don't 
want change. They want stability. Why? Because the conditions under which they became great powers are the conditions that existed before any change happened. So they don't want anything to threaten that. Uh, and that's just the way it is in the world. So if we want the United States government to do something other than that, we need to change the United States government. Thank you. So there's a hand here. Hi, my name is Kat. I'm, a, I'm in the anthropology department. I'm a doctoral student. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment before I ask a, a question to Joel. Um, I wanted to follow up on the comment about the safety um, and the allure of safety in Tahrir as opposed to the rest of the city. And I kind of wanted to expand on that just based on people I know who've been going to Tahrir uh, almost every day. Um, it's actually quite scary getting there uh, in so many cases. And one day, from one day to the next, there are so many risks and so much uncertainty, and it's really hard to predict what people will encounter. So I just want to sort of highlight the risk taking that's involved, but then also the kind of amazing social relations that are unfolding within Medina Tahrir, where uh, people of different social classes and different religions, um, Christians and Muslims, are coming together in ways that Egyptians have never really seen. Everyone's talking about this as if it's unprecedented, and that's also part of the allure. People get there and they feel ecstatic. And I just wanted to highlight that. So my question is, is there anything, okay, so I agree that the American government should do nothing. Is there anything that the American people can do to support uh, the people of Egypt who are protesting? So just one comment on your comment. Um, it was like that in the 1919 revolution. Uh, Muslim uh, preachers going to churches and preaching and priests going to mosques and preaching and uh, rabbis going to mosques and churches. So there was a certain um, sense of common Egyptianness that emerged out of that moment too. Um, and, and that idea has been an element of Egyptian political culture even when what, what, what was actually happening was exactly the opposite. So it, 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 there's, there's a reason why this is going on uh, in Tahrir. It's not exactly unprecedented. What can Americans do? Well, we can do two things. There have already been two demonstrations in San Francisco, one of them in front of the Egyptian consulate. Uh, we should press on our representatives uh, to try to get them to uh, make sure that the United States doesn't do anything or does as little as possible. Um, I, I, I don't think that's an easy one to win because this is about the whole structure of power uh, in the Middle East. Egypt is the linchpin of uh, the United States-Israel axis in the region. Egypt is the first Arab country to have signed a peace treaty with Israel. It's not going to be abrogated no matter what happens after this. But you know, in, in Israel, they're freaking out about it, of course. Um, Isra Egypt is collaborating with Israel in keeping the people of the Gaza Strip under siege. There are extremely close relations between the Egyptian military and the American military. Omar Soleiman wa was the key person uh, for extraordinary renditions uh, in the Middle East even before 9-11. Uh, he's up to his eyeballs in torture. Uh, so it's, it's going to take a lot more than this dramatic as the events in Egypt have been to uh, make a big change uh, in America's uh, stance uh, in the Middle East. That, that may come. It depends how things roll out. But, but this, where we are now, isn't enough. Thank you, Joel. Lisa, did you want to? So perhaps we have uh, time for one, possibly two questions. Anyone on this side of the room? Uh, yes, here in the center. Maybe if you wait for a microphone, one will come to you. One here. Sorry, thank you. Just coming. 
Hi, I'm Zainab Atalai. Um, so we talked um, a lot about um, the uh, United States' response to uh, what's going on in Egypt, and we say we, we should look away from the Cairo Washington dynamic for a bit because you know it's really what's happening there, what's important. Uh, but at the same time, this is a very interesting test for the Obama administration. So we cannot help ourselves um, to ask what the Obama administration is really doing. On Friday's um, press conference, the White House spokesperson went to pains not to make a clear comment on what they think, what he thinks, and he kept uh, repeating, oh, it's not our business, it's the Egyptian people's business, we can just you know, watch and uh, hope for the best. But at the same time, we know, as you say, that that is, of course, not uh, what's going to happen. Uh, maybe not to um, guess what they're going to do, but could you comment on um, the Obama administration's conduct stance on the events so far? Because they have been pretty evasive, but at the same time contradictory. So if you could comment on what they have done so far. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't know that I have a clear sort of judgment. It seems like in the early days they were just sort of trying to figure out exactly how to manage the situation. And since then, you know, in a sense they've been pursuing what Joel has encouraged them to do, which is to have a bit of a hands-off attitude. Now, what is happening behind the scenes, we really have no idea about what's going on um, person to person in terms of U.S.-Egyptian contact. But. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I don't really have much to say. I mean, I'm, I'm not really in a position to judge Obama's performance on this, unlike Sarah Palin or others. <laughs> Good to distance yourself from her. Um, I am even less in a position to know, but I will report um, third hand uh, about a meeting that was held in the Oval Office with a number of uh, Middle East specialist political scientist types who are my friends. And um, there were two phenomena that were notable in the room. Number one, most of the academics wanted a job in government and they trimmed their sails in order to uh, make themselves <coughs> acceptable for that. Number two, the people in the administration were much more concerned with what various generals were thinking than with what the people in Tahrir Square were thinking. So you can extrapolate from that how things might go. Not too well, I think. Thank you. Perhaps one brief question to, at the end. Hey, my name is Tim. I'm an undergraduate freshman from Slovenia. Um, I don't know, looking at the situations, I really feel like, you know, you have right now oil is going about 100 by speculations that because of what's happening in Egypt, sorry, uh, Egypt is incredibly important for, you know, maintaining the blockade in Gaza, like you said. So it seems like something has to happen, right? Um, at the same time, you have no clear leadership. We're saying foreign countries should stay outside and let this, you know, be an internal issue. So paradoxically, it seems that Mubarak is the guy who has the most power and who has to do something, right? Um, my question then would be, were you Mubarak? What would be the best thing to do for people? Because I think that isn't an easy choice either, you know? He hasn't been concerned about the best thing to do R for right, people for 30 years. Why uh, now? I, I agree, but just sort of a hypothetical. What to do? How do you organize sort of a movement from sort of an unorganized sort of grassroots movement towards democracy? How do you do it? I've never seen an example of it really effectively and happening and, you know, being done well, what would you do? How does that look like? 1989, Eastern Europe. That's a pretty powerful example. Think so? yeah. um, you know, we certainly know there are communist parties, for example, that continue to perform quite well electorally in the post-communist period. So I don't, I think that by purging the NDP, as they've done over the last few days of some of the most egregious violators of what we might consider sort of the social contract between party and people, the, um, the Mubarak is trying to set up um, a possible post-transition role for the NDP to play, probably in the hopes of maintaining this sort of um, patronage-based voting where the NDP can serve as an umbrella organization for lots of different types of interests 
particularly individual economic interests associated with landowners or big clan leaders. And, and note that this is very different than what's going on in Tunisia, where the, uh, the CDR, the, the former ruling party, uh, has been frozen, and there is a judicial proceeding underway to determine whether the party should be disbanded and declared illegal. You might call Vladimir Putin, who managed to uh, <laughs> remake himself and stay in power for an extended period of time, even without a party or a Soviet Union. So on that dark note, let us conclude and thank Dr. Blaze <laughs> and Dr. Uh, Bainan for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Oh, what a dark note that was, yes. <laughs>